So it's my pleasure today to be talking about uh, Meta's uh, global service mesh. And that's correct, we're gonna jump in a couple of layers on their OSI uh, um, layered model. Uh, first of all, let me kind of explain what is a service mesh. Uh, well, at Meta, most applications are architected using the microservice paradigm, and there was a very nice paper yesterday at ATC, which it was characterizing a lot of the microservices. So if you wanna learn more about that, please take a look at that paper. But if I want to simplify how this works is that every application is decomposed into microservices, these are commonly replicated and service instances are deployed on containers, on physical machines, and this process is being managed by uh, Meta's cluster management system that's called Twine. Uh, but here we're concerned about how do these services communicate? And this is typically achieved through RPC frameworks, and at, at Meta we use the Thrift RPC framework. Uh, however, that functionality alone is not enough. At least it lacks support for advanced features such as service, service discovery and layer seven load balancing. And to solve these data centers uh, turn to service mesh architectures and existing such architectures use either a sidecar process or sometimes a remote proxy through which we can offer uh, those layer seven uh, functions. And increasingly, we've seen companies adapting the uh, sidecar paradigm because of uh, it reduces complexity, implementation, and, and maintenance. And examples of that include Lyft's uh, Envoy proxy, uh, Istio, wrapper around uh, Envoy, and Uber service mesh. And with this approach, each service process has an L7 sidecar proxy running on the same machine. And its job is to route the request on behalf of the service. For example, here on what you see on the slide, when service A on machine two uh, wants to uh, communicate with service B, the proxy on machine two will first discover service B instances uh, here on machine three, four, and five. And then it will have to make a decision on how to load balance the request across those machines. Now, most service meshes also employ a central controller which directly configures each sidecar proxy's routing table. Uh, but Meta hosts tens of thousands of services which are massively replicated, uh, resulting in millions of geo-distributed RPC clients and uh, L7 proxies. So it becomes a challenge to scale to um, millions of clients um, with a global service mesh. Moreover, uh, Meta Service Mesh needs to support billions of requests per second, uh, but this, as you might imagine, incurs insurmountable hardware costs, and we give an example with um, some of the advertised measurements of uh, Istio, which uses a sidecar approach. We show that if we want to handle 1,000 requests per second, we're gonna need around 0 0.35 virtual CPUs. So if we do the math and, and try to see what that means for 10 billion requests per second, that comes down to us needing 1.75 million uh, small um, um, AWS VMs, which use two virtual CPUs each. So minimizing the hardware cost, it's another major challenge that a global service mesh uh, needs to address. Also sidecar approaches at um, extra routing tail latencies due to the added message and uh, marshalling and marshalling uh, the messages between the client and the proxy. Um, and there are measurements out there from prior work that actually evidence that they, they take measurements and they, um, we know what that overhead looks like. Uh, to make things worse, services can have hundreds or even thousands of hosts and each of them will have a variable load and also they can be distributed across region. And this can be a problem because in region RTTs in the order of microseconds where cross region can uh, vary from, uh, tens, uh, uh, from tens to hundreds of milliseconds for regions that are very far away. So picking the right endpoint entails this trade-off between latency and load balancing. Uh, so going back to our example, should machine two route requests to machines three and four that are closer but have higher load, or should we pick um, machine five that might be in a region far away but is underutilized? Uh, there's also another uh, major challenge that is not covered by existing service meshes, and that is adding support for sharded services. This is very important. Um, at Meta, uh, more than 65% of the RPC requests are actually due to sharded services and um, Service Router has support for that. I'm not gonna cover that in this talk, but please take a look at the paper for those details. 
Uh, the challenges I outlined before um, are addressed with uh, service router, as made as a global service mesh. I'm gonna use SR to refer to service uh, router. And uh, SR has been in production and evolving since uh, 2012. And next I will introduce some uh, key design um, uh, concepts behind uh, SR. So first, as we said, service router needs to scale service discovery to millions of proxies and clients. And uh, to do that, it uses independent controllers which execute different functions, such as registering services or generating per service cross-region routing tables using global information. And these controllers independently update the routing information base, but are not concerned with directly configuring or managing the individual proxies. Uh, in contrast, the RIB is massively replicated such that there are sufficient replicas to handle read traffic um, from the millions of proxies that can now talk to those replicas and self-manage and self-configure. And, and this self-management of the proxies is really what allows the control plane uh, controllers to scale. Uh, SR, because of this design, can seamlessly support all major service mesh topologies, such as the um, embedded library approach, where you embed the uh, layer seven functionality into a library and then you integrate that into the microservice. It can also support a Lucaside load balancer where service discovery can happen um, at the Lucaside process, or even the, the traditional sidecar proxy or a reverse middle proxy. And each of them come with their own trade-offs and these are analyzed in detail in the paper. But the main idea behind minimizing the hardware cost is to uh, move away from the common use of sidecars and kind of pay that a little bit of a complexity penalty and instead provide the service mesh functions out of a library that is directly linked into the RPC client's executable. And um, SR uses the library approach to route actually 99% of the RPC traffic in Meta's fleet. And this allows us to avoid a proxies overhead of processing and forwarding traffic. Uh, now, there is a caveat here of managing um, um, the mappings of uh, all the shards or the service discovery information, but the clients don't need to store all that information locally. Um, SR actually uses uh, the concept of a mini RIB where you store only what is actively being used and uh, needed by the client. Uh, service router also strives to simultaneously minimize RPC latency and balance load across global regions. And to do that, it uses the concept of uh, latency rings that bring um, locality awareness to the system. Um, for example, during load balancing, SR will use a variation of the PIC2 algorithm, which basically picks two servers at random from its mini RIB cache. Now, instead of PIC2, uh, randomly sampling two servers from its an entire candidate pool, it's going to use the latency rings to filter out the long latency servers and then sample out of a stable subset uh, from the remaining servers. So looking at uh, the configuration, uh, let's say a service owner said that um, there are locality preferences as we see at the top hand of the slide. Given this, SR will first consider all the servers in regions A and B, which are part of ring one. If it finds no servers, then it's gonna start considering servers in um, ring two and then um, ring uh, three and so on. And this default setting of rings roughly maps uh, ring one to having hosts that are within the same region as the source uh, client. And ring two includes hosts from neighboring regions. Ring three expands to continent and ring four is actually a global ring. Uh, now, as you might imagine, all these decisions in the library approach have been made um, in a decentralized manner. And while this does reduce routing latencies, it still has some limitations due to the lack of global view. Uh, for example, here, we might be picking all the, the servers that are close to us, but we might be missing an opportunity to load balance to ring two. Uh, and there is also a case where maybe we're making independently but equally bad decisions and we're all bombarding the same server in the same way and this might create a cascading failure effect. And to address this SR uh, uses the, its cross-region routing service which we refer to as XRS. And XRS will periodically collect per service global traffic and load information. This is basically RPS information and CPU utilization, and these are being aggregated per region. And it's gonna use that information to compute a per service cross region routing table, which is then going to be disseminated to all the L7 routers through the RIB. 
And this computation also depends on the um, uh, locality range, rings, which are now expanded to include load uh, thresholds or load information. And intuitively, the example we have on the slide means that when ring one's load is above 55%, then XRS will loosen its latency restriction and is gonna start considering routing traffic to servers in ring two and so on and so forth. And this is an iterative algorithm which terminates when no region is um, overloaded or all of them are equally loaded. Um, for completeness, I will briefly show um, how some important components of SR relate to systems that you might have already seen uh, within Meta. Uh, so the GRS is an important component and receives service placement updates from Meta's uh, cluster management system, Twine, but also shard mappings, which receives from uh, Meta sharding framework, shard manager. It also receives the routing tables from XRS, which I just introduced. Uh, SR also uses both manual and automatic configuration updates, and these are being maintained through Configurator. And here I wanna say that most of these configuration updates, almost 99% of them, are basically driven by automation tools. Okay, so now let's move to the evaluation where I'm gonna focus on the three challenges that I focused throughout the talk, and that's scalability, hardware costs, and cross-region load balancing. Uh, some overall numbers, Service Router currently operates in um, around 13 data center regions. It can route billions of requests per second, sending hundreds of terabytes per second from millions of RPC clients and L7 routers. And this just goes to show SR's overall hyperscale. Uh, a more important aspect of Service Router is the RIB, or the, or the routing information base, and its distribution layer. Uh, RIB encompasses close to 10 Paxos acceptors across several regions and a couple of thousands, uh, say around 2,000 at the uh, moment that we did this, uh, Paxos learners across even more regions and millions of hosts. The RIB memory across regions that its total size is currently at around 12 gigabyte and this is replicated at the distribution layer for a total of uh, 60 terabytes, allowing this to be highly available across the globe. In terms of writes on the Paxos acceptors, which um, are frequent and need to be persisted, uh, we found them to scale quite well. So RIB currently exhibits a write rate of 335 writes uh, per second, receiving 40 megabytes per second on a day average. Now the write rate, uh, in its absolute number might seem quite low, but this is because uh, a lot of the writes are uh, heavily batched. Another major challenge a service router set to address is the hardware cost of the global service mesh. And to better understand the savings of the library approach, we designed an experiment which compared a baseline RPC client that basically just uses Thrift to send a request against an SR client that uses the library approach and an SR client that uses the middle proxy approach, which also give us an indication also what will be the sidecar overhead as well. And this experiment showed that the SL lib mode, the library approach, incurs around an 80% computation increase compared to the baseline uh, no layer seven functionality implementation. And this is due to the other work for filtering and load balancing. But even more important is to show, we want to show that uh, this is a fraction of the cost of what you will pay if you wanted to put that functionality into a proxy uh, process, uh, whether it's uh, remote or um, on the same host. And uh, this is because not only the proxy needs to integrate all this functionality, but now the client still needs to work to marshal and marshal the data and prepare the communication between the proxy and the, and the client. So overall from this should be evident that the library approach comes at the fraction of the computational cost of an approach using a proxy. Uh, lastly, uh, I wanted to show a real world example of how XRS uh, was able to shift traffic across regions to avoid overloads. And this figure shows the average load across several regions in the span of 40 minutes. And I'm gonna focus specifically on regions uh, uh, zero and two. So we've seen here at 953 that region zero, uh, zero exhibits a high load which exceeds its ring two threshold. At that point, XRS evaluated shifting some traffic to regions zero ring two regions, which actually included three regions, but it chose to shift some of the region zero traffic to region two because it was the least overloaded one. And in particular, it decided to shift around 5% of region zero traffic to region two. This worked quite well. It brought down the load to 65% below the thresholds. 
Unfortunately, in the next, uh, next minute, there was another spike that actually su surpassed uh, even the ring four threshold. And, and then XRS again responded uh, by calculating new routing tables that actually shifted 25% uh, of the traffic again to region two because it was the least overloaded one, even though in this case it considered uh, basically all the instances uh, of the service across all regions. So, uh, and then after that, we, we observed like a healthy uh, load across all regions. And overall, this whole process just uh, uh, above, it's important to understand that it was fully automated by XRS without any manual intervention, and it demonstrated that XRS is uh, basically effective in dynamically managing cross-region traffic. And to conclude, uh, the main points of uh, the presentation today was that service router massive RIB replication allows scaling to millions of L7 routers. We've seen how the embedded library approach results in great hardware savings uh, compared to a proxy approach. We've seen how source-based locality rings can help reduce latency, while some uh, global computation with XRS ensures graceful and automated cross-region failover. And there are also various aspects that are due to the uh, limited time that we have, I wasn't able to cover, but I will encourage you to take a look at the paper for those details. Uh, with that, I conclude, and I look forward to your questions uh, at the Q&A session.